Okay, uh, first of all, don't worry about the slides if you don't see them well or anything. Um, there's not really much to see about them. Um, they're just for illustration, nothing really to understand. Uh, I'll still upload them to the internet if anyone cares. Um, so, okay, I'm Valentin. I was also already introduced. Um, I'm really happy to be here today. Um, the obligatory, how did I get to Nix? It was five years ago when I read Elko's PhD thesis. And it was like a revelation to me. I was like, why didn't we have that thing all along? Or something like that. It solved so many problems with building software such that we can finally forget about them. Um, and back then, I would never have thought to be like in the middle of this community who made this happen among all these great people who enable Nix every day. And yet, I, I'm here now and uh, will present to you what we've done about documentation in the past half year. And that would have been possible without Tweak. Um, I'm really thankful that it's uh, that I can be here today and having worked, uh, having worked on these things. So I'll share with you what we've been up to. We'll briefly go over um, what everybody knows already. I'll show what we've been done doing about it. I'll propose what I think we should do next as a documentation team. And if you agree, what you can do to help us get there, closer to that vision. So if Nix is known for anything except for purchasability on, on, on all the cool things, it's the learning curve. And that already starts at the very beginning. So there's no real overview, no real explanation what Nix is or does exactly. And if you try to look for one, you'll present it with a wall of text. And even that wall of text is, well, just another list of features. And we're really good at like telling how cool Nix is and what it does, um, but that's not real explanation. And it turns out, eventually, people don't even like to read all that much. And they also don't really care how it works as long as it does. So you'll all agree it's way more fun to play with something to get the hang of it. So we start with the tutorials. And the first steps are innocent, right? Run Nix shell. And that's what, that's what gets people hyped about Nix. Um, and they really, oh my god, this is like magic. I want more of that. And even setting up a Python development environment is so manageable, I mean, if you know or care about Python. And if you don't and want to use a language such as Haskell, which is really well supported by the Nix ecosystem, which I just recently learned was also due to Tweak, um, well, you're presented with another wall of text. And maybe now you kind of get this idea of this learning curve thing. Um, well, you would have to read through all, that, through all of that to even understand what the hell is going on. And at this point, where these tutorials and guides start to fail us, we'd usually fall back to the reference documentation, like look at the real thing, right? But newcomers usually don't find it. It's so far hidden um, um, below the fold that they don't see it. And even Google search doesn't help. Like web search, it's no use because it's, uh, the pages are so large, they're ranked way down by search engines or not even indexed at all. And what inevitably follows is what people refer to as tap explosion or mental stack overflow. Um, it does get the job done eventually, but let's be honest, it's, it's a lot of pain. Um, so all of us here obviously stuck lo around long enough to overcome that hurdle, to learn all these little tricks and details. And I suppose it's called expert blind spot. We forgot how we got there. I would say we actually erased it from our memories like a trauma, you know. And um, eventually people do reach the manual somehow. And then they find that they're incomplete. So here's an example from the Nix language. Uh, I've compared all the major Nix language tutorials to see which language features they actually talk about, which they present. And on the left is the manual, the reference documentation uh, for the Nix language. And it has gaps. So no wonder people get confused about things, because it's really hard to find the right information. Um, so none of this is news, I hope, or unfortunately. Um, what have we done about this? So the first, step, the first step was to get an overview of the situation. There's this thing called Diataxis. It's a framework for structuring technical documentation. I won't go into detail about this. Um, we'll go over it practically. Um, the point is it allows looking at documentation from the perspective of users' needs. Given a piece of documentation, what kind of problem does it help, help solve for the user? Um, so I made a little survey of what's out there for Nix, and I categorized it um, both by the Diataxis categories and also for each component in the ecosystem. And of course, that's incomplete, but this is just supposed to give us a rough overview of what's the state of affairs. And we already observe a few things very quickly. So all of the major ecosystem components, Nix, uh, the Nix language, Nix packages, and NixOS have reference documentation. That's already good. 
But as we've seen, it's full of holes. And um, because it was the only documentation that we had for the longest time, it also tried to solve all these uh, user problems at once, being not really good at any of them. Um, the how-to guides, it looks like there are quite a bunch of them, but the point of the guides is to uh, lead users step-by-step -step to solutions for their problems. So essentially, they represent use cases. And obviously, Nix packages and NixOS do many, many things. So if you put that in pers into perspective, it's way too few of them. The tutorials are supposed to teach the skills that are needed uh, for users to solve problems on their own. And there are multiple Nix language tutorials out there, so I'm, we've seen a few uh, in this overview. Um, but if you look at them closer, they don't really, they're not really effective of teaching people these skills. Um, at, at the very least, they don't set expectations what people are supposed to know when they finish them. So, and if you ever develop stuff in Nix package or NixOS, you will also agree that there's lots of skills that you actually need to get productive. Uh, even simple things, such as navigating the code base, knowing where to find what, this, these idioms and patterns that you have to learn, uh, this whole um, software development workflow outside of the regular software development workflow. So we simply don't have enough tutorials to get people up to speed quickly. And for explanation, uh, so the point of this explanation category is to g provide more context, to uh, give an opportunity to understand certain concepts better. And we notice here that it's really thin on sources. It's mostly based on Elko's PhD thesis, which I think is excellent writing. I, I even think it's the best writing that we have in Nix documentation. But it's, well, it's a PDF. It's not maintained. It's, in a sense, out of date because the ecosystem has grown so large. And um, it only, uh, like, it does a lot of things and, and it covers only, uh, a small part of it is only covering this whole background and contextual stuff. So that's what I intuitively focus on first. I saw this gap. So why don't we fill it with explanations? So it happened at that time, it was like in April 2022, um, that John Erickson set out to document Nix documentation, uh, sorry, to document Nix architecture. And I was around, and so I sat down and listened to him, like explaining how Nix works internally. And after a few sessions, we boiled that down to a bunch of uh, diagrams and textual descriptions. We compiled a little table of terms used in different build systems, which mean the same thing, so that can, people can reuse their existing knowledge. I've made a little overview of concepts in the Nix source such that people can learn them in, in a nice order. And um, unfortunately, still none of that is merged in the Nix manual, uh, but hopefully we'll get there soon. But the point is, it got the ball rolling. And I started talking to more people about documentation and learning things, and eventually, uh, someone put forward the idea, well, why don't you apply for this tweak internal project thing? And I did, and I got funding to essentially work on Nix documentation for quite a while as my job, in a more organized fashion and do something about it. So at that point, that was in May, uh, I already had an overview. And the next thing I came up with was, was the following idea. What uh, if we had something like a journey into Nix, like a curriculum, uh, the list of things that you would have to learn in a certain order to get into Nix very quickly and effectively. And the bulk of the required material, which is like getting familiar with the shell and um, um, learning a bit of the Nix language and going into uh, declarative environments and all these things, and it only eventually go really deep into the software development lifecycle using Nix. So the bulk of the material is already present on Nix.dev um, and the Nix OS wiki, if you're familiar with any of that. And of course, it would make sense to reuse as much of that as possible and just rearrange it in a certain way. Um, so, quite naturally, I asked um, Domin, the author of Nix.dev, and Jörg, who's one of the maintainers of the Nix OSVK, um, to sit down and see how we can collaborate. And pretty quickly, we thought about, in all seriousness, about forming a Nix documentation team to work on these issues. And fortunately, we quickly agreed that we should collaborate and not step on each other's feet. Um, and uh, like, immediately, the question arose, so if we want to get closer to that vision, what are the first immediate steps that we have to do? What kind of immediate problems do we have to solve to get there? You cannot get there all at once, right? So you have to do some small incremental steps. And now that I had the time to go about it more systematically, I, I took a look at those infamous community survey results um, that Ron talked about multiple times. They're really valuable. And to simply to find out what would be something that helped people most with the least amount of effort. And yes, one of the key things is that uh, most people in Nix, like more than a third of an actor, actually are new to Nix. So if you look at that specific directly, it doesn't really matter here, is that uh, almost half of the community is using Nix for less than three years. And you have to consider that it takes one to three years to get proficient in Nix. So effectively, almost half of the users that we currently have that were answering this survey 
either are factually newcomers, beginners, or feel like beginners. But what kind of problems do they have that doesn't really emerge from this data? Um, I sat down with actual beginners. So I observed 10 of them, people who used Nix for the first time or were in the early stages of using Nix or learning Nix, and that revealed some very concrete issues. These have been talked about a lot, and I tried to represent them in this little overview in the beginning. But that was very, very concrete. It was um, like on point, a list of things that we can immediately fix. And so I brought this, um, these results up in the documentation team. We discussed them and um, looked at this whole big picture. And three um, like major patterns emerged from this. People have problems with naming, with flakes, and the Nix language. So naming are things like, uh, why is everything called Nix? Nix, Nix language, Nix packages, like what's the difference even? Um, so we can do something about that, like we wrote down the definitions and put them in a fairly visible place, we still have to make it more visible. Um, but it's also questions like, um, what's, what's an official project in the Nix ecosystem? Where do I get reliable information that I can trust? Um, for Flakes, people wonder, what is, what is it even about? Um, how do they help me? Should I learn them? Should I adopt them? Uh, will they stick around? And if, how long uh, will it take until they're stable? We cannot do much about this without getting involved into like high-level project leadership or marketing, all, all that stuff that would be out of scope for the documentation team. But we could do something about Nix language. We could introduce people systematically to it. And that's what we did. Um, and in fact, writing a Nix language tutorial would remove a major roadblock of getting into the Nix ecosystem. Because as you see from this like, journey into Nix, it's like a choking point into the rest of the stuff. And this graph is not even representative, so it's really abbreviated to the end. The lower half would be like 10 times the size. Just the NixOS part would fill the entire screen if you broke it down. Um, so it's kind of a core thing that will, that will actually unblock a lot of people. And well, after two months of writing and rewriting and reviewing and testing it with a bunch of users, we finally merged the thing a couple of weeks ago, and now it's on next.dev. Um, at this point, I would like to thank Sylvan for his awesome reviews, who made sure that the thing is technically, technically correct, the best kind of correct. And um, as Domin uses to say, and I agree, the only thing worse than missing documentation is incorrect documentation. We have to work on that a lot. Um, but it's also not pulled out of thin air. It's based on the 2019 NixCon lecture by uh, Jonas Chivaye and the Nix language one-page overview by Vincent Amble. So thank you both for like, laying the groundwork that en en enabled this. And what I think we achieved is quite substantial because already the user testing and feedback shows that it does help users get into Nix more quickly and time will tell um, how that that influence to take. So that's not the only thing we did, obviously. Um, we helped merge a bunch of large and small requests, uh, made lots of small changes to the manuals, which hopefully will help uh, people get on board more quickly to reduce this initial confusion. Uh, we discussed various little details. And this list is growing, growing, growing all the time. And I think by now it's spiraling out of control. And I think now we should go a bit more strategic about these things. So we need a vision for the future. Well, uh, we need at least to answer uh, the question, what are the high-level goals that we should at least be aware of before jumping on to the next thing, such as we did with the next language tutorial? But that was really obvious. How do we even reliably identify what, what's a valuable goal to achieve? What to work on next? So I have a proposal for documentation. For each quadrant in this documentation framework, let us define what we want to strive for. Uh, I won't go into explanation, but for reference, we of course want it to be complete, correct, and easy to update. Um, guides should cover all the major use cases. We of course first have uh, identified them and make a small set of them that we want to focus on first. And tutorials should teach all the key skills that we uh, expect from people to be self-sufficient in the Nixie system. And that should take a minimal effort from the learners. The whole thing should be versioned in lockstep with the software that we're documenting. Um, so we're still quite far away from that. And each of these areas should have a dedicated maintainer, a person that can keep coherence, someone who can take off the respective pull requests and um, essentially know the whole thing by heart to tell people where to put what. And we don't have such a person yet because the material is just is too much. Um, so I hope that we can agree that these are worthwhile goals to pursue, at least roughly. But this is still another wish list. We are really good at writing wish lists, but you have to act on them at some point. And how do we go about that? 
well, we can't stop the world, I think, and just go off for a year working on reference documentation, update the tooling, all that stuff, because life goes on. As we speak, new users are joining the next party. People may be making pull requests that we have to take care of. Um, and the code itself evolves, so we need to cater to many different needs and probably all at the same time. So what do we start with first? I suggest we do what Nix does best, something that Nix taught us to do well, declare dependencies explicitly. Here's an example how we could do that for reference documentation, just one part. Uh, it should be complete, correct, and easy to update. But what do we have to do to get there? So one example would be document all the exported functions with examples. Um, type uh, annotations. Um, examples should be tested automatically and other stuff should be done automatically to also ease uh, use of updating such that user errors don't sneak in. And documentation should be easy to find such as it's easy to update and it should be documented how to actually work with it. There's more things that we can do, but especially we have to do more things to even get there. And if you look at the big picture, which is quite large already and still incomplete, so I came up with this graph like in half an hour and just spent the rest of the time arranging it nicely. Uh, if you break it down more in more detail, it will like, be three times as large or maybe more. Um, but what we see that there are some tasks that many others depend on, the red boxes. And what if we focus on only these and say no to everything else for the time being at least? What happens is that a roadmap emerges naturally. What is a roadmap? It's a collection, it's a sequence really, of sets of tasks that we have to work off in order to enable uh, working on the following tasks. And I hope none of this is new. Uh, I think it's called the critical path method. And I'm not even qualified to talk about project management or anything here. What I want to say is, I think we should have something like this for the documentation project for each of these errors that we've been talking about. And in fact, I think we should have something like this for all of the next communities. Simply for everyone to know at any point in time what to work on next, even if you just arrived. And most of the time that I've been spending is essentially figuring these things out. And that we can break that down to a couple of minutes. I hope that may be a way to finally get on top of things. Just to remind you, I think everyone in the room knows this, but maybe not everyone on the internet. There's something like 10,000 open issues or pull requests on Nix packages or in Nix. That's way too many. Even if you boil that down just to red boxes to these leaf nodes of the dependency graph, it still remains tons of work. Who's going to do this? Well, think about it. What's um, the characteristic of open source, community-driven software projects like ours? What do they all have in common? Participation. Changing them is a core feature. That's what we can do with all of them. It's a first-class use case, and I think we should treat it as such. And that is what I think the documentation team should work on next. Make the process of contributing to the next ecosystem the most welcoming, smooth, effective, and rewarding out there. And everything else will come. Still, we cannot do this alone. We've seen the tens of thousands of pull requests. This thing is so much bigger by now than any single one of us or any small group of people. So we'd, we need your help. But who is you? So of course, all of you in the room, you're already working on Nix, it seems. But we still have to continue to rely on volunteer contributors on these people's passion and energy. And we know for a fact there's many, many people who will gladly um, offer an hour here and there, or even more, much more, to help the project succeed. And so now I'm talking to you, everyone. If you want to improve Nix, help improve documentation. Search on the internet, how to contribute to Nix documentation, you will surely find the little overview we've prepared already a couple of weeks ago with a collection of small, ongoing, but always self-contained tasks that anyone can pick up immediately and then go off and help, help make the world a better place one pull request at a time. And I mean, that's why I think we should work on this next, um, improving this contributing workflow, because we simply cannot afford to waste people's time if they want to help out. And at this point, I would usually say, okay, thanks for your attention and head off for the buffet or whatever, but it's not that simple, unfortunately because it doesn't end here. Um, let's think about these 10,000 issues and pull requests. So at best, if I succeed today, asking for help, people will flock to GitHub and open new issues and make pull requests and all that stuff. We just have, we'll just have 10,000 more of them. It doesn't help. At this scale, doing this one pull request at a time thing, it doesn't cut it anymore. We absolutely need some coordination, and for that, we need maintainers. People 
who know the thing in and out, people who know what to do next, people who are really quick at assessing whether a contribution is worthwhile to even pursue. And the problem is, of these 500 people who contributed only in the last month, most of the changes they did are only about code. Okay, I'll tell a little story now. Um, in the past months, I've been talking to lots of people, and at some point I lost track how often I've been told, it's so great that you're doing this, awesome, thank you very much, finally. Because people hate writing documentation, people rather write code, you know, something that does things, something that works. And only recently I stopped wondering what the hell must be wrong with me, because I actually find this fun and rewarding. And so, like three weeks ago, staring at the blank screen, trying to figure out what I will talk about today, it suddenly struck me. Of course people like to write code, because software and code solves people's problems. But so does documentation. It does things, it does things in people's minds. It also solves problems, very immediate problems, people's problems with the software and the code. So what's the difference even? I mean, after all, it's all just character strings typed into a computer. What if we treated documentation more like code? What if we develop documentation more like we develop code? Because for all intents and purposes, documentation is code. And why don't we just apply all the software engineering best practices that we know and love, but to documentation? Basic, simple things that anyone who's into computers, um, and also in their right mind, would never live without, such as version control. Of course, documentation should be under version control, but take a wiki, for example. It only has version history. And if you know what a Wikipedia edit war is, I don't think that you would want to develop your code that way. Separation of concerns. We already, already talked about the user-oriented framework. Every piece of code should have, serve one purpose, so should documentation. Single source of truth. It's quite obvious. Keeping it simple, not trying to be clever, not trying to be funny. It just distracts people. Data types. That, that's maybe not that obvious. I mean, data types help um, with readability and refactoring of code, but that also applies to documentation. It's also simple things such as, if you have a collection of things to talk about, don't inline them in a paragraph. Use a list instead, or maybe a numbered list, or maybe even a definition list, depending on context. Tests, of course, you write tests before um, making a pull request. And you run them also before making a pull request. Why don't we do the same with documentation? And this is about like running tests on the examples such that they are correct. Run tests on the actual documentation, whether it works. How do you run a test on documentation? Well, you run it on users. You check whether it actually works for them. Code readability. I mean, of course, we read documentation, and we also care a lot about readable code and programming. We even have frameworks around formatting, and not all of the reasons for those are stupid. Um, but documentation is no different. We even have a dedicated programming language. I'd call it Markdown English or something. We even compile it to HTML. So we can have lots of fun with this analogy. We can even throw in dependency management for good measure, like prerequisite knowledge and references to external definitions as built inputs and runtime inputs. So anyway, I can have another talk on just on this. Um, my favorite is, of course, documentation. We have to tell people how to work with documentation and to unwind that stack that all ties into helping people contribute to a whole project. And it starts, I think, with documentation. Okay, if you're a software developer and you still find documentation boring, just imagine writing documentation is something like programming people in Markdown English. But we need even more maintainers. We need people who can focus on one thing and do it well, otherwise simply nothing will happen. There are just too many rabbit holes to fall into. And I think there's lots of untapped potential still uh, for great maintainers outside the audience of software de developers. Mm, because the tasks involved in these areas are very different. So of course, uh, working on reference documentation is a very technical task. You have to be intimately familiar with the code. You, know, you also have to write lots of code to make it work. Um, but guides are more, I mean, in lack of a better term, like marketing. You have to know the product really well to uh, kind of map out the use cases and describe them to people uh, nicely, and it's less about code. Tutorials are essentially teaching, and explanations involve lots of storytelling. And while all of that requires some technical expertise at the least, they're all dedicated skill sets that people go to university or work for for many years to get good at them. So we need these people, not just to improve documentation substantially, but as a community to become better of, uh, with what we do. So I say this now to everyone who believes in the ideas behind Nix, but doesn't want to go into the code too deeply yet. Please consider becoming a maintainer. Please consider taking ownership of some part of documentation and um, help this rapidly growing community 
does what it sets out to do, to quote Elko, take over the world. You can make a huge impact. We need good writers yeah, to improve the use of language and to tell better stories. We need teachers to help people all over the world learn non-trivial skills. We need designers, not just for illustrations and diagrams, but to become better at visual communication as a whole. Even, even MBAs, I mean, please help us with project planning. Please help us keeping focus. We need all of you people, and we can a lot, a learn a lot from all of you. And in turn, if you are open-minded, I think you'll also learn a lot from the technical domain, things that you can use otherwise and elsewhere. So if you're interested, please get in touch with the documentation team, and we can see um, how to get you onboarded. So we've talked about coordinating the effort with maintainers, but to keep that effort going, someone has to commit considerable time to do all this boring, annoying, hard things that volunteers simply won't do because volunteer work has limits. Most people don't have the privilege to work for free for a long time. They have to be paid, so we have to talk about money. If we want to find and keep good people that can take care of the things that we as a community care about and to actually improve on them, we have to pay them. So I'm a living example of how that may work. Like three years ago, I started making small contributions, and now working on X is my day job. And again, I thank Tweak for making this possible. It's amazing. But I'll probably have to step down from leading the documentation team next week because my funding is running out. And that's natural. It's not about Tweak or me or anyone, really. Um, and I don't care who does the job eventually as long as it gets done. I mean, I'll gladly hand over to anyone who's willing and actually able to afford to step up and take the responsibility. But what I do care about is how do we keep up this momentum that we've been building? Because I hope from what I've been telling, you also see that we have just begun. So I say this to people in charge. We have representatives of various companies here at the, at the NixCon, and I hope the internet is also listening. Um, look, the, internet, uh, the Nix community, it needs trusted, what I would call, custodians. Reliable partners who can help us provide the resources to maintain and grow our collective assets. And this is not just the code. It's mostly the people. People like Elke Dolstra, Teofan Hofschmidt, Silma Mosberger, Robert Hensing, all the great people that I had the pleasure to work with in the past months, just to name a few. And um, if your organization relies on Nix thriving and being alive, if your developers would benefit from better documentation, if your hires would benefit from a smoother onboarding process, please consider helping to continue what the Nix documentation team has begun by providing us the resources that we need to work effectively. And I emphasize in the long run. Because, okay, there's many ways to help us. Um, money's good. In-kind donations are also fine. Yes, indeed, please send your experts. Help us with becoming better of what we do, where we are not good at yet. Um, and for donations, of course, the... Uh, prime address is the NixOS Foundation. All the board members are here today and I suppose tomorrow too. If, you, if you're interested specifically in documentation, please talk to me. But I think this concerns all the Nix teams, all the people that are actually want to do something substantial about Nix. Um, and I emphasize again, what's really important is sustainability. I'm convinced that Nix is an investment in the future of all of software development. And many people here have been at it for a long time now, trying to like make good and that on that promise to make that dream come true. And documentation is only a tiny part of that. So for that investment to pay off big time, and I think it can, we still have a very long way to go. And I hope you, uh, that I could convince you today that we need everyone's support. It doesn't work without the other. We need um, engaged volunteers. We need passionate maintainers, and we need those custodians. Custodians that we can rely on to provide the necessary resources to get the work done. So we have a plan. We know what to do next, at least roughly. We have many ideas how to actually get things done. So please, let us get together and make that happen. So if you want to get in touch, here's my contact details. Thank you very much. I'm sh Give me a second. <laughs> yes, yeah, so am I. <laughs> so I'm sure there's hard questions, and there's enough of them. Okay, Domin. 
Thanks. Um, yeah, thanks for a great talk. What, what I can offer is, you know, with NATO, we've been organizing an ocean sprint for two times, and there's another one coming in November, and most likely another one in March. So if you're looking to escape, you know, hard winter in Europe and US and come to Canary Islands and write documentation for one week, this, we can make it a theme. And, you know, all you need is approval from your employee, employer to come. Um, and, you know, of course, Valentin, you're welcome to join and help us make it happen. We've been working on documentation as part of that sprint as well. So hopefully that leads us a bit closer to the goal. And again, thanks for your talk. Thank you very much. Um, you talked about software engineering principles and uh, as a software engineer, one of my favorite things to do is uh, deleting code. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on like deleting documentation because I think it's often easier to add a little something and it balloons, maybe not in official sources, but everywhere, right? And people just Google stuff and then they find things that are outdated by years and years, and nobody knows, because nobody feels that they have the authority to change anything. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. That's a good point. Um, so in principle, it's already hard to write concise documentation, and I think it's the same problem for code, like trying to find a minimal solution for your problem. Um, yes, deleting is good if the stuff is outdated or wrong, and this is what's part of this overview for occasional contributors. Let's try to make the Nixos wiki smaller, because it doesn't offer version control, um, I wouldn't say, as Rock said, 2015 to kill the wiki. Let it die slowly. Let, let's kind of ev let it evaporate and merge the good stuff into the uh, curated version control documentation and let the other stuff disappear. Um, deleting other stuff which is not under our control is a lot harder. For that, we need, well, something that we probably won't get, like large community buy-in, where people posted tons of blog posts about things that are way outdated, which simply like either are not best practices, best practices or don't work anymore. That's a lot harder. Um, but if we provide authoritative documentation where people don't have to look on the internet for all kinds of things, maybe that's not so much a problem. So I think right now we are in the process of, we have to grow documentation. Right now it's not enough. Some of it's wrong. If you find something that's wrong, it's deleted. On the next says we can just throw it away. Do you have any opinion on like when fixing problems live for someone in a chat versus having something more long lived on discourse or a, a stack exchange type of thing? Like, are we just wasting a lot of time fixing problems when they pop up? Could we have something more long lived or at least searchable? That's a great question. Uh, I do have an opinion. I have lots of opinions. Most of them are probably wrong. Um, but yes, I would love if we adopted what, what's so far called the Boy Scout rule. We should find a better name for this. Uh, so whenever you find a problem, um, it would be great if instead of just fixing one person's problem in the chat, as you say, or in person when you like hack on next with friends. So before you do anything, you make a pull request to the official documentation. It will probably get stalled until we have enough maintainers to actually take care of this. Um, but that would be way, way better. Um, and I know this is a lot of work that also stalls your process. You want to show some, some, something about Nick, you want to show to your friends. Oh, wait, it doesn't work. Let's first make a pull request. Oh, how do you do that again? So this is why we want to work on contributing first. It should be straightforward to fix a typo. It should be straightforward to fix a fact. Um, and then, please, yes, do that. Like, don't let that sink into this information black hole that matrix is. At the very least, and there's actually in this uh, contributor guideline, there's an overview where to put information. This course is a good first step because nobody has to like look at it. The Nixos wiki, uh, well, sometimes it's worthwhile still to improve the existing material, but even better, just put it into the reference manuals if possible. Put it on nix.dev um, if it's a tutorial or guide or you want to fix something about it. Do that, look at the uh, overview, how to contribute to Nix documentation. Hey, Valentin. I'll ask uh, one question two ways, and you can pick which way is more important to answer. Uh, now that the next language tutorial has been merged, what's the next big chug point to work on? Or what were in those red leaf nodes that you had up on the slide? Uh, there's a bunch of things. Um, it, we're still working this out in documentation team. And I, I think, so actually, um, what to work on next, I think I said. Um, making the contributing workflow better. Um, 
we still have to take care of like the influx of issues and pull requests that will probably arise from this. But the, the, the leaf node and the dependency tree is probably some, some tool that would allow us to create those graphs in the first place. Because GitHub doesn't have a, a feature to display dependencies between issues and pull requests. Uh, I mean, not issues and uh, an individual pull request, but issues and other issues. Um, we, so we can express this by just writing a link to another issue, but we have no way of querying this systematically and producing these nice little graphs. If someone built a tool which does just that, I think that would help a lot of people. So if anyone wants to sit down and do that, please do that. Um, for reference documentation, currently something obvious, which you can actually see from this graph if you uh, could read it, um, is rendering uh, reference documentation from source code comments. There are a few people interested in doing this. Uh, if you look for this, maybe you can find them and uh, work together. That would be a really worthwhile goal because it would get us closer to this everything is a single source of truth and correct. Yeah, nice work. It's looking cool. Uh, documentation is a problem. Uh, but do you know where the most up-to-date documentation for Nix is? Uh, sorry, I didn't get the question. Uh, do you know where the most up-to-date documentation for Nix resides? Well, it does reside in the manual, uh, in the manual for Nix and Nix packages and NixOS, and also on Nix.dev, and I hope that no, is where it should no, go. No, it's not any of those places. Come again? It's not any of those places. It's the integration tests. I have solved so many problems by looking at tests, yeah, because that is documentation for me. Not, not English words, code as tests. You talk about testing the documentation, but the integration tests are the documentation. Do you understand? So every time we need to check something in, a feature, it needs an integration test, even if it's very, very simple, because they're educational tests. Do you, do you, do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, uh, of, of course. Um, I think those tests, if they're written well, should be part of the documentation that people can actually read, for example, how, how to use the code. And they should be tested as part of integration, of course. But it's quite a far-fetched goal. I mean, we're just at the very beginning. There's a lot of technical stuff involved, and someone has to do this, right? And there's lots of stuff. Yeah, I agree. It's a worthwhile goal. It's definitely a worthwhile goal to pursue. The question is what to start with next. I agree, it's a worthwhile goal to pursue. Don't worry, you can have a conversation. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so, Valentina, I've got another question for you. Um, what do you think the place of stack overflow in all this is? Because one of the things I teach my students is Google your question. And one of the top things that Google gives me in most of the programming or anything about it is most of the time stack overflow uh, answer. So do you think, what, what do you think the, the, the place is here? Um, it, it's a, a kind of a Sensitive question. So I don't have really an opinion on this um, because it's sort of in the realm of community management. It's, it's kind of at this intersection point. So what if we crowdsource this how-to documentation, right? And uh, Stack Overflow is just one tool to do that. There's multiple options to do that. Um, well, uh, to be honest, I don't know. I haven't thought about it too deeply because we, I think we have other concerns right now. But it's a worthwhile question to pursue. Please feel free to discuss this on this and GitHub. Just uh, sorry, on Discourse, there's a recent thread where um, someone talked about this. Give it up one more time for Valentin, please. Maybe a standing ovation, right? <laughs> Better you standing ovation. 